Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers, uh, VSI, for inviting me uh, here to present today. It's a wonderful opportunity to be here with you all. <clears throat> so, for me, context is very important to understand where we are and where we are going, uh, and also to understand what opportunities there are. So what I intend to do today is to give a little bit of context regarding sugarcane productivity, to see what that means when we think about the future, especially when we think about uh, in terms of sustainability. So as we've already heard today a few times, sugarcane is one of the most efficient plants at fixing uh, biomass through photosynthesis. And there's been various, various studies to try and estimate the theoretical limit of productivity. And one of them that has been uh, quite widely quoted is this uh, theoretical limit of about 380 tons of cane per hectare. And if you, if you take an average over the year, about 13.5% uh, sucrose content, that would translate to about 50 tons of sucrose per hectare. So if we think about modern sugarcane breeding, it started about 100 years ago, more or less. So if we think about, as we heard today uh, already, uh, Code 205 was released in, uh, sorry, 1918, uh, Code 213, 1928, uh, POJ 2878, uh, 1921, and also the Hawaiian Crossing Solution was developed in 1924, so that's its 100th anniversary this year. So if we look at the progress of the last uh, 100 years, what does that tell us about the next 100 years? The, this graph here is showing the yield uh, progression in Brazil over the last 100 years. So going back into the early 1900s, uh, the, the yield of sugar, and here I'm presenting uh, data in terms of tons of sugar, not tons of, sh of sugar cane. So back uh, in the early 1900s, Brazil was producing about two tons of sugar per hectare. And then uh, really about in the 1960s with new technologies, breeding, etc., that increased to a maximum of 12 tons per hectare. So in fact, over the past 100 years in Brazil, the sugarcane uh, yields increased by a factor of six times. And that's really due to the combination of improved varieties and also uh, coupled with management, so uh, better fertilization, spacing, irrigation, weed and pest control, etc. But if we look at the last 20 years in Brazil, the yields have basically plateaued at about 10 tons per hectare. Part of that was due to the production of mechanization in Brazil, where you have uh, additional losses during the harvesting process and then also damage to the, the, the stools and the, and the ratoons. So although the yields have increased impressively by six times over the last hundred years, over the past 20 years the yields have been more or less static. But what does, what does this mean when we think about what the potential of sugarcane is um, and what we can do to try and reach that potential of 50 tons of sucrose? So as I mentioned, in Brazil at the moment, the average is about 10 tons of sucrose per hectare. If we think that the theoretical average is about 50 tons, that means we have a 40 ton gap in terms of yield. And so this 40 tons gap, is this due to genetics? Is it due to environment, management? And what can we do to try and uh, fix this? So although the average yield in Brazil is about 10 tons of sucrose, as we've seen in some of the earlier presentations today, in individual fields, the yields are much higher than that. So in Brazil, we, uh, at CTC, we keep a big database of, of commercial fields over many years. 
So we have data on more than 19 million hectares over 10 years. And if you look at the top 10, the, the top 100 fields of that, the average of those top 100 fields is, is more than 40 tons of sucrose per hectare. And if you look at the top 10, 1%, it's about 30 tons. And we can see reports from, from other industries as well. So in Australia as well, there's commercial fields that are producing more than 30 tons. And we also see in India uh, some examples are very, of very high production. So, so what that means is that the average production is 10 tons per hectare. The actual genetic value of our current germplasm is in the region of uh, 30 to 40 tons per hectare. So that's already 70 to 80 percent of the theoretical limit if we, if we take that as 50 tons of sucrose per hectare. So what that means is that that yield gap of 40 tons is made up about 15 tons of genetic gap, which is about 40 percent, and about 25 tons of environment slash management gap, about 60%. Uh, so what can we do to try and close this gap? So obviously breeding will play an important part, but I will come, I will come back to this a little bit later. But as we've seen in the previous slide, management, but management in its broadest sense, including environment, etc has even a bigger role to play. And without this, the genetic potential of our current germplasm can't be attained. And especially when we think about the future and climate change, managing for resilience will be really key for sustainability. Because as we've seen from some of the presentations this morning, climate change means more extreme events, so either more drought events or more flood events, but that can happen in the same region. So it's one thing to breed varieties for either drier conditions or wetter conditions, but it's very difficult to select varieties that will perform well in both dry and wet uh, environments. That's why resilience is really the key when we think about uh, management and environments. So when thinking about climate resilience strategies, there's a whole range of things that I think the industry needs to start taking uh, uh, cognizance of and looking at seriously. So this is just a, a, a summary of some points that were raised in a review published in the ISCCT uh, latest bulletin from December. So things like soil health, as we know, increasing organic matter in the soil can uh, increase water holding capacity, which has drought alleviating effects. Uh, doing structural things to help with rainwater harvesting, reducing runoff, water storage, water efficient irrigation, precision agriculture, as we've heard today with drones using uh, nano formulations, etc., and also coupled with weather forecasting. Agroforestry uh, integration, this can help also with extreme weather events, thinking of wind and lodging, and also variety selection. So in terms of variety and selection and breeding, as I tried to show in the earlier slide, the, the breeding has already pushed the genetic potential of our varieties to about 70 to 80 percent of the, of the theoretical limit which makes it even harder to push uh, genetic gains by breeding further. But really the first thing is to get the basics right in terms of breeding. So you need to select the best parents, plan the breast crosses, select in the right target environments, and also phenotype appropriately. And only when you have those basics well established that it's worthwhile thinking of going to uh, modern breeding techniques. And when we talk about modern breeding techniques, I've, uh, I've used the slide here from a publication of a former colleague of mine at ICRISAT, uh, Rajiv Varshni, 
where they talk about the, the five G's uh, for crop improvement. So the first G is the genome. So we need to have genome assemblies for our uh, crop species, both sugarcane and also the, the wild species. We need to have the germplasm well characterized uh, at both the genome and the, agro at the, and the agronomic level to be able to take advantage of these genome assemblies. We need to have, based on the, the, the genome assemblies and the characterization, we need to be able to identify uh, genes and also functionally characterize them. And using that, we can then start using uh, genomic breeding approaches such as genomic selection. And then finally, we can then also, with that information about gene function, we can start using gene editing to improve uh, genetic performance. So just in terms of where we are with these five Gs approaches at CTC, so there are five public saccharum genomes uh, available uh, in the literature, and also we have additional uh, CTC genomic information. In terms of germplasm characterization, we have over 9,000 clones, which have been well characterized for many traits, and also each of those clones have been characterized with more than uh, 50,000 SNP markers. In terms of gene, uh, function, we have transcriptomes of two CTC varieties with gene adaptations, and also there's many public information uh, available on NCBI. In terms of genomic breeding, based on the germplasm characterization and the SNP markers we have, we have genomic selection models um, to select uh, both for sucrose content and for sucrose yield in different environments. And also in our laboratory in St. Louis in the USA, we have various uh, proof of concept uh, projects using gene editing, taking, <coughs> using some of the uh, information that we've gleaned from the, the genome and the germplasm approaches. But it, it's all very well having huge quantities of data but often the implementation of that is not trivial. <coughs> so this is just another example of uh, a publication, also from uh, Rajiv Varshney and colleagues, looking at grain yield and rice. So in this project, they identified 120 rel uh, relevant genes. And then on the top part of the figure, you can see all the genes listed. <coughs> And, they, and what function they have in, in various parts of the phenotype. And based on characterization of the germplasm, they were able to identify 21 specific haplotypes or uh, gene variants amongst these uh, 120 relative genes that really have the greatest impact on yield. But it's still a great challenge to assemble these 21 haplotypes into one genotype to actually realize that yield. And in sugarcane, this is even a more difficult uh, thing to accomplish, seeing that we don't have back crossing to, uh, to integrate those genes. <coughs> Thank you. And also to think about how you would apply this in sugarcane. And obviously, drought is something that everyone always talks about. But as Prakash, Prakash already mentioned, drought is an extremely complex phenomenon with a long list of phenotypes that contribute or potentially contribute to drought. But you would have to do this kind of exercise looking at the genes involved, the haplotypes, etc., which is a very long and complex process. So just to summarize, if we assume that the theoretic that the uh, theoretical yield limit for sugarcane is about 50 tons of sucrose per hectare. Modern varieties that have been developed over the last 100 years already deliver 80 to se uh, 70 to 80 percent of that yield potential when they're grown under ideal conditions. As conditions change, particularly with climate change, these new 5G tools 
will be needed to complement traditional breeding to maintain these uh, yield gains and to close the yield gap. But in addition to the breeding, adapt adaptive management strategies will be essential to realize the yield potential already provided by the improved varieties. Because without this, there is a high risk that the sugar that sugarcane production could be negatively impacted by climate change. Thank you.